Josh from Multiversity here with the one and only Jason Aaron. How are you doing tonight? Awesome. How are you? I'm doing all right. Had a very long day. <laughs> Probably not as long as yours. It's only Thursday. We've got, only we've got all weekend. So we'll uh, we'll cut to the short and sweet of it. Um, Wolverine. Your run on Wolverine is very quickly becoming one of the most iconic in a while. And from a longtime fan of the character, what did you think when you won that that talent that art that uh, talent search in 2001 that you'd make it this far? No, of course not. Um, I mean, th just this past week, the an omnibus came out of a bunch of my Wolverine stuff, and I wrote in the intro to that. Like, no, I mean, I, I never expected when I won a little talent search contest that, that the, like, ten years later, it would be this hardcover coming out full of Wolverine stuff that I've done. And I'm still doing more. So, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's been awesome. I, I've, I've literally been, been writing Wolverine as long as I've been in comics. Um, and I've still got some more stories to tell, which is great. So, how do you develop uh, Logan's voice from issue to issue? You, you not only seem to be bringing a lot of elements of, of his publication history into things, but you also seem to be bringing a lot of your own history. I, I read your blog on Newsarama, and there seems to be, it seems to be a very personal angle that you take with Wolverine, and I'm wondering how you structure his voice. Um, well, I'm, you know, you have to bring up something personal to everything you do, whether it's a story about, you know, things that are real world or aliens and superheroes. There's still got to be a piece of you in it somehow. But I, I don't know, with Wolverine's voice, it just is kind of developed over the stuff I've done. To me, it was kind of easy. It's, it's certainly easier to write characters like Wolverine and Punisher who don't talk very much and are very kind of a... Uh, uh, have a right, very, very direct, and and have a very direct speaking style as opposed to Spider-Man, you know, which was which was really hard. Uh, yeah, I mean, Wolverine's one of those voices that's always kind of come easy to me. I, I love westerns. Um, I love samurai movies. Uh, so I think Wolverine and I have similar tastes. I love country music. I've had him singing country music songs. So. Yeah. So. Plenty of writers have answered this question, but from your perspective as the one in the driver's seat, what motivates Wolverine? Well, I mean, that's not an easy question to answer. I mean, he's a... The easiest thing is that he's a, a, a noble guy. He's got a noble heart. He's got a checkered past, but he's always trying to, to do the right thing. Doesn't always make it. He's a, he's a deeply flawed character. Uh, um, and he, you know, he wears those flaws on his sleeves. He knows that they're there, but he still can't change. He still is who he is. But, um, you know, he's, he's always trying to do better. I mean, the stuff I've just put him through at Wolverine and leading into the new Wolverine and the X-Men book, it's all it's all a progression. I mean, really going back to the that little talent search contest story that I wrote, um, you know, was Wolverine starting to re grapple in some sense with religion and belief in a higher power and and all that's kind of carried over through everything that I've done to what's going on right now. Uh, thank you for giving me a very good segue. Moving into the Wolverine and the X-Men schism side of things, um, those who have been reading Wolverine's book at this point can see a progression uh, in Wolverine's attitude that he then brought to a forefront in Schism, but other than the stuff happening in, in, uh, in the book that you had him write involving uh, certain bastard children, um, what, what else would you say motivated Wolverine's um, decision making in Schism and now in Wolverine and the X-Men? Well, I mean, I think it's all in the pages of Schism. I mean, if you if you know what's going on in the pages of Wolverine, that certainly adds to it. I didn't want to reference that to to uh, confuse people who weren't reading it. Uh, but to me, it's just uh, that's part of what Wolverine's always been. Uh, he's always the guy who's been protective of the younger generation of mutants. Uh, he would rather be on the front lines instead of them. But in Schism, we just see you know him kind of reach his breaking point and realize. You know, if this is what we've become, we've made a wrong turn somewhere along the way. So this past week we saw the first the first in-story breakdown of who Kieran gets and who you get in Wolverine and the X-Men. And I noticed that your book includes not only the, the new X-Men characters that uh, went to the school, but also members of really every generation. You have Cannonball representing the New Moons, you have Chamber and Husk for Generation X. Uh, what is it that draws you to these younger characters? 
Well, it, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a school book, so certainly we're going to have a, a share of, of, of younger generation characters, but really with the cast overall, um, it, it, it pulls from, like you said, from different generations of X-Men. Um, you know, we've got a chunk of the, we got Iceman and Beast, so a chunk of those original Lee Kirby X-Men. They're characters from the, you know, the Lynn Ween, uh, Dave Cockrum relaunch. They're uh, Kitty Pride, you know, who was the first sort of younger generation, uh, second generation X-Men. Um, you know, so Quentin Choir, who's my favorite character from Morrison's run. Idy, who's one of the newest mutants. So I pulled from all different aspects of, of X-Men history to throw them all in a pot and see what happens. Speaking of X-Men history, what are, what are some of the stories that are really influencing your run on the X-Men? I've been rereading a, a lot of stuff. I mean, I've been rereading those uh, those Lee Kirby X Men uh, uh, comics, and the the opening page of Wolverine the X Men number one is very much modeled on the opening page of X Men number one. Uh, I've been rereading the you know the Claremont and Burns stuff, uh, and I've always you know I've always been a huge fan of the Grant Morrison's run, which is uh, probably my all time favorite X Men run. Riot at Xavier's would probably be my favorite X-Men story. Um, so that said, my, my book is not, the Wolverine the X-Men is not a Morrison book. I'm not trying to ape his run. I'm not trying to ape Claremont and Byrne. This is hopefully something that straddles all that, but is a little bit different. How many uh, arm wrestling matches with Karen Gillan did you have to win to get the characters you wanted? <laughs> You know, we didn't we didn't have any fights. We both wanted magic, but we were able to work that out. Uh, he got her. Um, but you know, I mean, mostly the characters kind of fell into place. You could look at the character and say, ah, they would go this way or they would go that way. We both wanted surprises in the book. Um, you know, certainly Quentin Choir does not come along to Wolverine's side of his own free will. He's dragged along. So, and there are still more surprises to come. Like you, you haven't seen the full cast of my book. Um, you know, we don't even, there's a couple of characters who show up late in issue four. Um, so there's still, still a few more surprises in there. I remember you mentioned in an early interview around the time that uh, Wolverine of the X-Men was announced that you and Kieran had argued to the point when you realized you were arguing over characters like Magic and Marrow who none of you would even really want. It didn't really get that far? No, 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 that was exaggeration. No, I mean, we, we argued the points of schism and kind of that the retreat where we really beat out schism, we realized at one point we, were, we had half the room arguing Scott's side and half the room arguing Logan's side. You know, and I stopped and realized, like, this is exactly what we want. We want everybody, we want both these these two viewpoints to have, uh, have meat on their bones. So we did that, and then the characters just kind of fell into place. Switching to a new side of the Marvel Universe, uh, you're also going to be relaunching The Incredible Hulk this month. What is it about the Hulk that made you want to write that book? Well, I've always been a, a fan of the Hulk. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I like those characters who are sort of oddballs. Hulk is very much an oddball in the Marvel Universe. He's not a typical superhero. Um, so I, I, I like the chance to try to, again, do something a little bit different. So, it, you know, what I'm doing in Hulk certainly plays off um, you know Hulk's history and that Banner Hulk dynamic, but but does a new new twist on it. Would you say you listen to the same music as Bruce Banner? <laughs> no, probably not. Um, but you know this is a little bit different Banner than we've seen in the past too. A little bit crazier, a little bit more dangerous, a lot more dangerous. Uh, moving into Punisher Max, a lot of people have remarked that really the Punisher works best both from a publishing angle and from a character perspective when he's completely unhindered and and you are kind of given the big sandbox in that regard you kind of get to write a Frank Castle that doesn't really have to pull his punches and I'm wondering has that been has it been kind of daunting in a little to have that much freedom with the character no it was daunting to follow Garth Ennis on the book that was daunting but no I mean it's more the opposite when you get to do what you want it's very freeing um, I've, the, the, you know, the, in the midst of that bullseye arc, there was one issue while I was writing where I realized, you know, does the Punisher need all ten of his fingers? And I didn't have to worry about, oh, well, that means he, somebody will have to draw him with nine fingers whenever he shows up in Daredevil or whatever. 
if I wanted to cut off one of his fingers, I could. So, um, and then you know, that's, if you read the if you read the current arc, that's not the only bad thing that's happening to him. Things are getting worse and worse for Frank Castle. Um, so yeah, I, I have a blast with that book. What is it like working with Steve Dillon on that book? Because unlike other artists, he also has a history working with Frank Castle. Have you managed to mesh at all with him while working on the book? I hope so, yeah. I mean, Steve. Steve's great. Steve's one of those guys who's been around, you know, been in comics a long time. He's drawn, good lore. I mean, just the stuff he's drawn in Preacher alone. There's nothing that can shock or surprise Steve Dillon. Um, so he's a guy who can make anybody look like they know what they're doing. Um, and I'm just happy that he's been able to do the whole book. You know, Dave Johnson's been able to do the, all the color, the covers. Matt Hollingsworth done all the colors. I'm really happy we've been able to keep the, that, that team together for the whole run. Moving on to Scalped, how does it feel to kind of put your baby to bed with the with the series wrapping up uh, pretty soon? It feels good. I mean, it's time. You know, it's it's time to to wrap things up and give these characters the endings that they've had coming for a long time. It'll be weird once I'm not writing those characters anymore, but I'm excited. I'm not sad to see it in. I'm I'm happy getting to write these stories that I've wanted to write for a long time now. How far back um, did you plot out the ending? From pretty early on, I knew where most of the major characters would wind up. I didn't know exactly how those you know last few arcs would work out, but um, yeah, I mean, with, everything's been building towards some very specific ending points for quite a while now. Do you have any other creator-owned work coming down the line? Yes, most definitely. Nothing I can talk about. Um, you you won't you won't see anything until after Scalped is wrapped up. But once it is wrapped up, certainly you'll see me doing multiple new creator-owned books. Um, you'll see me working with RM Gera again, the, not on an ongoing series right out of the gate, but we're already talking about what what our next project's going to be. I had heard that you actually never you hadn't met RM uh, until pretty late into your Scalped run. What is it like working that deeply with someone that you've never actually met? It, w it was weird, yeah, we didn't meet it until last year. We, we got to meet again this year. I got to hang out in his house in Spain a little bit. Um, it's weird, I mean, I'd, I'd been working with him for five, six years by that point before we'd ever met, but we talk a lot. You know, we're, we somehow kind of hit the same wavelength. We're very different people, he and I. But, you know, we, we, we somehow can speak to each other in some other sort of language. Um, so he's a guy that I hope to be working with for as long as I'm in comics. Kind of wrapping it up with a kind of broad strokes, more grandiose question. Uh, your blog on Newsarama, you spend a lot of time talking about your own writing technique and talking about what it really takes to write comics in this industry and to, to work as an artist and to write as someone that's unhindered. If you could kind of sum up all of your experience into one nugget of advice for an aspiring creator, what do you think you would uh, you tell them? Well, one nugget, I would just say if you want to be a writer, just write. You know, there's, there's you can't wait around for some sort of perfect moment to arrive because it's never going to happen. Just just do it. If you, want it. if you want that to be your job, then treat it like a job. Give it the hours that it has to have and just don't take no from people and find, find a story that you believe in and just work your ass off on it. Very good. Thank you very much, sir.